morning. I'm cartoonist and columnist Ted Rall, and you are seeing me in my unshaven, unwashed, pre-digested state on this Monday morning, November 11th, Veterans Day. A salute to our veterans and to everybody who is heroically shuffling off to work this morning while I am just getting ready to draw some cartoons and bitch about the world and shit. So, what pisses me off? People always want to know where you get your ideas. Well, you get your ideas when you're a political cartoonist from things that piss you off. And for me, that is more often than not my love-hate relationship with the paper of record, the old gray lady, the New York Times. Today's New York Times features a TV review by TV critic Alessandra Stanley about a new 10-part documentary series uh, by Oliver Stone called The Untold History of the United States. Now, I haven't seen the uh, documentary at all. Um, I'll, uh, Mr. Stone didn't see fit to send me an advanced set. I would have probably been a lot nicer to it than Alessandra was. But I have looked through the book that uh, is based on the series uh, at the bookstore. And it looks, um, it reads, it's pretty good. If you're familiar with Howard Zinn's uh, People's History of the United States, you probably don't need to read this thing. Uh, it's not essential. Uh, basically, it's a litany of America's foreign policy and domestic sins uh, from World War I up until the present. And, you know, what I found really fascinating about Alessandra's review, which I'm going to get into in a minute, is how she really, like, lays on the snark in a way that is so incredibly political. I mean, okay, so if, you know, you do something like Band of Brothers or any number of cheesy Steven Spielberg movies, then those things get just reported very admiringly and questioningly. But a left-wing perspective is always criticized roundly and severely and exposed to the kind of, um, of analysis that just nothing on the right or in the quote-unquote mainstream ever does. Okay, so let's take a look here at what Alessandra Stanley has to say. Okay, so the title alone is easy to scoff at. Oliver, Oliver Stone's untold history of the United States sounds almost like a parody, a send-up of that filmmaker's love of bombast and right-wing conspiracy. This documentary b series, beginning Monday on Showtime, isn't a joke, though some may find it laughable. Well, some might find Alessandra Stanley laughable. It's deadly serious, but also straightforward. A ten-part indictment of the United States that doesn't pretend to be even-handed, as opposed to the New York Times being pretending to be even-handed? I guess not. <clears throat> the series does not focus extensively on many of the things the United States has done right. Mr. Stone and the historian Peter Kuznick write the introduction to their similarly titled companion book. It is more concerned with focusing a spotlight on what America has done wrong. And that's fair enough. There are plenty of documentaries that celebrate American exceptionalism. There should be room in today's vast television landscape for a series that points out the exceptionable. And Mr. Stone, by the way, interesting tone, choice of words, right? The exceptionable. Um, well, that's assuming that mostly the United States is up to good stuff, and what is bad is an exception. Um, I, I just love the loaded language. And Mr. Stone, the director of Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK, is an all-too-eager Cicerone, a dramatist of truth who tramples facts to spin alternative histories that may be grandiose and grotesque, but can sometimes have a hint of grandeur. In this reworking, there's a loaded term here. We gotta, sorry, bear with me here as we go through the jump here on the Dead Tree edition. Um, the reworking of the past. Henry A. Wallace, the progressive who was vice president during FDR's third term, is puffed up as a greater hero than Roosevelt and Churchill. Stalin was bad, but Truman was just awful. Now, the reworking of the past it implies that there is a set past and that that is the truth, and that what Oliver Stone is doing is not uh, is, is revisiting, trying to change the past, as opposed to merely retelling it in his own way. Retelling would be a better word. Um, Alessandra, you need an editor. Don't keep telling your editor to fuck off over there at the Times. Okay, so the first four episodes made available to critics focus on World War II and the Cold War, but the series, like the book, spans World War I to the Obama administration. President Obama, in Mr. Stone's interpretation, isn't really any better than Woodrow Wilson or George W. Bush, someone who took a bad situation and made it worse by selling out to, quote, 
Wall Street funders with deep pockets. So bear in mind the setup here. Accuracy is sometimes hard to find, she says. And then she launches into this interpretation about Obama. Well, it's certainly true that many Americans, and I am one of them, do believe that Obama found a bad situation in, when he took office in the, right after the September 2008 financial crisis that continues really unabated today and did not actually stimulate the economy, but just uh, called something a, a stimulus package, which was really nothing but a sellout to the banksters. Now, I'm not alone in that. Many people feel that way. It's not an objective fact what she's saying here. But Mr. Stone's most pressing obsession is the atomic bomb and the Cold War which in this telling are the roots of all foreign policy and the answer to what seems to be Mr. Stone's unspoken question, why was I in Vietnam? Along the way, he raises some valid points, notably that Americans too easily overlook the Soviet contribution in waging and winning World War II. Contribution, Alessandra? Um, they did most of the fighting. They certainly did most of the dying. It's not a contribution. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, that's a very loaded word. Steven Spielberg and his ilk popularized the greatest generation and D-Day, by the way, no quotes around greatest generation, and other hard-won American victories, whereas the Russian film world has yet to produce a Slavic equivalent that could move an international audience. There is no band of comrades or saving private Ivan. What happened in Russia between 1941 and 1945 has mostly stayed in Russia. Well, actually, Alessandra, for a cultural critic, you should know that there are a lot of fantastic Russian and Soviet movies about World War II. I strongly recommend Come and See, a movie from the 1970s set in a village in Belarus. Uh, it is an astonishing uh, film, probably one of the 10 best films I've ever seen. Now, why are these movies not commonly distributed in the United States or shown on television or on Netflix? Well, I don't think that's because the Russians uh, didn't do a good job with their uh, film business. I think there was a little, the little matter of Cold War politics, don't you think? Um, untold history makes the point that while fewer than half a million Americans died in World War II, Mr. Stone says that as many as 27 million Soviets, military and civilian, lost their lives, though he doesn't factor in how many of those were killed by Stalin's repression. Well, uh, Alessandra, the, that number is the number of people who were killed by the Germans and other combatants in World War II. And Stalin killed several million people, mostly in the late 1930s, prior to, and also during World War II, but that number would be additional. This is known as a red herring. It's not certainly true that Stalin was a bad person, but it is not true that not the 27 million people, all some of them died from, the, uh, from Stalin's repression. Different historians put that figure at anywhere from under a million to over 5 million. Mr. Stone pays as much attention to Operation Barbarossa as Pearl Harbor. Now, he, she never tells you, but Operation Barbarossa is the German invasion of the Soviet Union and shows archival material, not just from Normandy and Iwo Jima, but also the Battle of Stalingrad, the German invasion of Ukraine, and other calamities of war. Almost all war documentaries find rooms for clips from Frank Capra movies and works of propaganda, and so this, does this one. Mr. Stone also includes a less familiar newsreel clip of Shostak Shostakovich after he composed the Seventh Symphony, which became a hymn to the Siege of Leningrad. Okay. Mr. Stone makes no message, uh, me mention of how Shostakovich was stifled, but he doesn't overlook Stalin's atrocities, including the 1940 massacre of Polish officers at Katyn. More often, however, he positions Stalin as a victim of British and American mistrust and double dealing, a brutal tyrant forced to be his worst self because American allies didn't do right by him. Well, it's certainly a point that uh, a lot of historians do think that there's something to that. And Truman in this iteration is the bigger villain, a hick and a bully who, pushed by a cabal of right-wing racist party hacks, unfairly took the place of Wallace on the 1944 Democratic ticket and who was persuaded by those same conspirators to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. Their real motive was not to end the war and save American lives, Mr. Stone argues, but to deprive the Soviet Union of victory and its spoils in the Far East and to scare Stalin into submission. Um, well, you know, it, there's a lot of historians who think that at bare minimum, the desire to, uh, sh to scare the Soviets 
uh, with, by dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that, that, that what those were a, a major influence on the decision makers there. You know, the saving American lives narrative, maybe it came, certainly bringing the war to a quick conclusion, must have been part of the calculus. But to say that that was the only thing, that it was a benevolent thing, and, you know, there's also the, the great cost of dropping the atomic bomb. We are now the only country on Earth that has done so. Osama bin Laden said in uh, several of his missives that if al-Qaeda dropped an atomic bomb uh, or set, detonated one in the United States, that we couldn't blame anyone because we had already set the moral precedent that it was okay to do so. So to just cavalierly accept the official narrative like that is, frankly, Alexander, lame, and I would say inaccurate. Okay, so... Mr. Stalin is not the first to argue that Japan was ready to give up before Hiroshima and that it was the Soviet un invasion of Manchuria that caused Emperor Hirohito to surrender, though he didn't surrender until after Nagasaki. Mr. Stone takes pride in calling his version of the past an untold story, but actually that same thesis was presented on American television in two documentaries on the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima, one a British-Japanese production on A&E and history, the other an ABC News special. Okay, Alessandra, learning, reading comprehension here. You just said yourself that Stone's thing goes from World War I all the way through the present, and the two things you mentioned are only about World War II. So it's the untold history of the United States has all been untold, I guess, according to you, on television, except for these two specials about World War II. Just checking. Okay. Mr. Stone brings a more tense story, a more stentorian absolutism, leaving no room for doubt or nuance. He doesn't allow for the idea that both ver versions could coexist, that the Soviet invasion of Manchuria was one of several factors, along with the two atomic bombings that finally did the trick. He is among those true disbelievers who cannot accept that a course of action can be both unforgivably awful and apparently necessary given the facts known at the time. Instead, he doubles down on his passionate indignation. Now, it's a somewhat fair criticism, but... And, and, you know, when I saw JFK, which I think is kind of crap, um, I, I think he, the, what, what Stone tries to do is to present his alternative vision to stimulate discussion. And he tries to do it in a very aggressive way because he's recognizing that he's going up a, against a tsunami of American propaganda of right wing uh, of right wing swill. So when you're going up against that, you know, if you go up with subtle nuance and you're trying to be fair and balanced, it's not, it, it, it often doesn't seem to as effective. So what he's trying to do is counter this, the weight of this right-wing culture with a little bit of his uh, liberal narrative. And it may or may not be right, but it, it's certainly understandable. I mean, it, it might not be the approach that I would have taken, but I admire it. And I think there's, uh, you know, it's, it's important to, for the left to give back as, as good as the right gives. Mr. Stone brings, uh, we already talked about that part. Let's see. Despite his denials, Mr. Stone intones about, about Truman. Intone is always a pejorative ter, uh, uh, verb here. His flawed and tragic decision to use the bomb against Japan was meant instead as a ruthless and deeply unnecessary warning that the United States could be unrestrained by humanitarian considerations in using these same bombs against the, United, the Soviet Union. Um, intoning or not? Yeah. In this untold history, Hiroshima, the Cold War, Vietnam, Iraq, none of that would have happened if Wallace had become president in 1945. What a wonderful world this would be. That's the end of her review. Well, you know, it would be a really wonderful world if uh, a left-wing filmmaker could release a, uh, an alternate version of U.S. history that was critical of U.S. Uh, policymakers and to get it, have it get a fair viewing and a fair reading. Apparently, the paper of record, the New York Times, just isn't possible. Anyway, if you like this, uh, this is my uh, first attempt at doing a little media crit thing first in the morning. Uh, I'll probably be doing this from time to time if people like it. And if they don't, uh, this will be the last one. So nice seeing you unshaven. Uh, I'm going to go and, uh, and shave. Check my email and, and shave now. Bye.